when this SOS begs you, implores you, requests you to give a decent burial to this ridiculous apex saga, and you, you two can do it if you stop the wheels. Because um, yeah. we know from the recent experiences with this application uh, that apex shows gross inexperience, uh, professionalism, lack of capital resources, lack of any kind of decent behaviour. So please advise the Minister to get Apex or Mill, Magnum, whatever, to fall on its sword and desist from mining in these special areas of our drinking water catchment in particular. Um, look, at something that Rivers SOS has been doing is not particularly pleasant and no other group has tried to do this. But since Planning Assessment Commission was formed back in Keneally's day, um, and we think it was like to keep decisions at arm's length from the government so the government wouldn't be held responsible for the approvals that have been going on hand over fist. We've been examining the composition of, of your PAC panels and we found, and we've complained about this incessantly, that too many of the PAC panels were weighted by panellists who were or who earned a lot of their livelihood by consultancies with the major mining companies. And because we've complained about this to Hazard, to Keneally, and, um, and, and, and to the Department of Planning itself, in recent years we've been really glad that it seems to be that um, retired public servants like Mr Ford have been employed more often than consultants. But I had a quick search of the uh, website yesterday for Mr McCotter, and I'm alarmed to find, and he might not to reply to this, that uh, he's uh, the chair or director of a company which has as its major clients firms like Extrata, um, Rio Tinto, um, <laughs> Yam Coal China, Cockatoo Coal Korea, Aluka Resources, and Cobra Coal. And I just think it's the most hideous conflict of interest. And we've actually seen it. Unpleasant. I'm sorry about this, Mr. McCotter, but we have to do it. Someone has to stand up and say the truth. We've actually put in a, a, a specific complaint to ICAP about one consultant who was actually working for Peabody's at the time he was sitting on a fat panel looking at Peabody's expansion of this Helensburg mine. And we've got documentation to prove it. And ICAP's a bit busy at the moment, but I hope they get on to it. I hope they get on to all this stuff. So I'm sorry to be unpleasant, but have to do it. Um, yeah, Rivers SOS put in a submission. Um, Rivers SOS, by the way, was founded in 2005, for those of you who don't know us, with 13 groups in our network originally, and now we've got about 48 groups in our network, which is statewide and we meet in regions around the whole fields of New South Wales and we're in touch with most groups. But um, people like me who live nearby have been especially concerned with uh, developments down here in the southern coal field. Well, our submission on the apex modification, as it's called, we make specific comment on the need to protect the special areas. So I'd just like to focus on the special areas here. And um, in our submission, we note that the development of coal seam gas is being layered on top of extensive underground coal mining with no assessment of the combined cumulative impact. Now, a lot of the newer groups are only concerned with coal seam gas and they, for whatever strategic reason, have decided not to take coal mining into consideration, but that's a big mistake in our book, so we um, continue to lobby about the cumulative impact of both things in the special areas in particular. And just about the special areas, I just would like to say, would like to concentrate on, on this because um, it's only 2% of New South Wales, but it supplies water to 60% of the people of New South Wales. That's 5 million at present and could be predicted to be over 6 million quite soon. Now, you know, if we as a society can't protect 2% of precious land that's supplying our population with water, what is wrong with us? What is wrong with that? What is wrong with the government? What is wrong with us? We vote for the wrong people, obviously. Um, <laughs> we voted for, oh, people did vote for 
very unfair because he promised not to allow mining in the special areas. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a huge problem. Special areas, just to, I mean, I'm sure most of you know this, I'm sure the panel know this, and uh, Mr. Ford was director of Sydney Water for a while, so you would know this, but special areas were declared under the Sydney Water Catchment Management Act for, um, for their value, that was in 1998, for their value in protecting the quality of the raw water used to provide drinking water to Sydney. So I wonder what Sydney Water has to say about the uh, quality of raw water if, this, um, if this, these proposals keep on going ahead. Um, and Mr Ford, I'd be really interested, but I know you can probably tell us right now. But anyway, they, they're said to be, the special areas are said to be a critical barrier in a multi-barrier approach, I'm quoting now from the SCO, the Sydney Catchment Authority document, to protecting water quality. They act as a filtration system for water entering water storages, that's the big dams around Sydney, by removing nutrients, sediments and other substances that can affect water quality. The greater the ecological integrity of the special areas, the more effective they roll as a barrier. Well, that, that kind of that is direct quotes. And that sort of thing is repeated at, at nausea, for instance, at the Warragamba Dam Visitor Centre, if you do the interactive stuff there. Uh, it's all about how the special areas are precious because they protect the water supply and filtrate it. And, um, and we've got to look after it. So it's a kind of parallel universe. You know, on the one hand, you've got this motherhood statement about how precious the special areas are. On the other hand, you've got the proving expansion of coal mining and coal seam gas extraction. And that's what I hope this panel will be able to put a stop to. I mean, it's, we've got to draw a line somewhere, and I think this might be it. Uh, Rivers SOS began our, our campaigns for these special areas way back when um, BHP Billiton got approval to mine on the Upper Cataract River, which supplies 7% 7, 7 of Sydney's water up through the Upper Canal to Prospect Reservoir. And um, Sydney Catchment Authority had actually employed an independent scientist to, um, to say how far back the mine should be from the river in order to protect this water supply river. And um, the independent expert said 350 metres. But in the end, it was approved only 70 metres from the river. And as a result, the river was cracked at red, red, red methane erupted, all sorts of chemicals, God knows what, into the water supply. And that's just one, that's just one aspect of the um, damage that's being done to Waratah Rivulet as well. And um, someone told me the other day Waratah Rivulet's growing really nicely now. Well, I live on the Cataract River, which is the other catastrophe, the biggest catastrophe in this area with mining work, uh, the Cataract and the, um, the Waratah Rivulet. Cataract doesn't belong to Sydney's water supply, thankfully. But I'll say from living there, I know that it flows really well when we've had a period of rain. I can hear it now from my bedroom, because I live on the cliff on top of the river. I can hear it flowing night and day. But I know in a week or two, it will dry up again, the pollution will be back, and the algal blooms will be there again, as they have been for over 12 years after mining ceased under my particular stretch of the Cataract River. And the Waratah River that will be exactly the same. It may look good after you've had heavy rain, but believe me, it won't look good in a week or two once the um, weather dries up again. I just wanted to make that point because I gather uh, people have been down recently and it looks all right at the moment. Um, just on the possibilities of remediation, which um, I have a quote here somewhere from, well, I might be able to find it, but from uh, Anne Young, who we call the Swamp Lady. She's uh, Dr. Anne Young, many of you will know of her, who uh, got her PhD um, in, in researching the swamps in, the, um, in this area. And she is very cynical about the possibilities of remediating swamps once they're destroyed. And, um, and that's something that's been happening um, now in the Dendrobium, BHP's Dendrobium mine, which is within the metropolitan special area. Um, you have swamps being undermined and more are uh, going to be undermined. One has dried up completely. These swamps feed the Cordo and Avon rivers which, which supply the Cordo and Avon dams. So again, that's another bit of destruction to Sydney's special areas. 
So, uh, you know, we, as I said, we've got to call off at some stage to this ongoing destruction. Um, I'd just like to say, I suppose I have to finish up quite soon. Um, I think you're all aware that there is a worldwide water crisis and we're using more water than we can possibly sustain, more groundwater, for instance. So I don't need to go into that, I don't think. But given that, given that we're going to face global warming and the droughts in the future, given that the population is expanding, you think, what on earth is the government doing? And I just might say in passing, there's an investigative reporter called Sandy Keane who's written a recent article for an online magazine called Independent Australia. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but she calls the current mining approvals process a rotting beast in which the government, the bureaucracy and the mining companies are colluding to destroy, um, well, as I say, particularly the special areas of mining that might concern. Yes? I just want to say that uh, the only people who will profit are the, uh, the overseas companies like Veolia, who will be running the desal plant, who will be paying a fortune as the catchment areas are, are denuded, depleted, destroyed, the special areas, and no longer to supply enough water for Sydney's needs. The desal plant will come into operation, and our water bills are obviously predicted to increased by about $700 a year with this and it's companies, it's been privatised of course, the diesel plant, and it's already costing us a fortune just to be mothballed and um, when it comes into play, when this particular, um, when this drought erupts again, then we're going to be paying a fortune in water bills and these companies, these private companies will be profiting from the running down of our catchment. So I noticed that the earlier has, I looked at the earliest contributions to, um, uh, to politics and on the Democracy for Sale website, and I noticed that they've given thousands of dollars to the Liberal and National parties. And I don't know why they uh, omitted Labor from that, because they're just as compliant in all this as the others, but it's been good as the Nationals. So, uh, yeah, Diesel, Diesel, and our, uh, Diesel will take more money out of our pockets. They already are, because we're paying something like a million dollars a month and over 50 million a year just to keep it mothballed. And once it starts producing water for us um, and it can supply about 20% of Sydney's needs, um, then we'll be paying so much more. So that's probably...